Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Modern Forager webinar. And we're going to have Orion join us here in just a minute and spend the next hour talking about plants and mushrooms and all the fun things we're, we're trying to forage. So hi, welcome, Orion. Hey, everyone. And uh, so we have, uh, I don't know, we have about 50 people joining us right now, 45 at the moment. Um, the live, the, uh, the sharing to Facebook is not happening. I'm hoping that'll start here soon. Um, I guess we'll see how it goes. We got plenty of room here in this, in this Zoom right now for, for everybody that wants to join though. Um, let's see, we'll look at a couple of, uh, couple of uh, house cleaning issues here. Uh, you'll notice that on your screen you have the ability to chat and we can see your chats in here. Uh, when you say hi, I see Zach, uh, Matt, people like that. And um, uh, feel free to chat. We also have a Q&A and you can post a question to Orion or to me or to Christian, Kristen or to all of us, however, however you want to. So feel free to interact with us via Q&A and chat right in there. Um, I'm going to I'm going to try to push this onto Facebook right now. And Orion, if you want to um, uh, introduce yourself here and tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and and I really want to hear how you how you started foraging. Sure. Yeah. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me well. Um, like Trent said, my name is Orion Aon, um, and I'm the like owner creator of Forage Colorado. Um, which is a bit of a passion project hobby business that I've been working on for uh, five years now. Um, and I've been foraging to some capacity for about 20 years. I started mushroom hunting when I was 10. And um, that sort of was like an annual like trip that my family would do. We would go mushroom hunting and, you know, once or twice a year, it would, be this whole ordeal, you know, three, four hour drive to our spot, usually pick a bunch of mushrooms. Some years we wouldn't find anything or find very few. And then um, I kind of, that, and I grew up in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So um, we were hunting down a little south of Colorado and then came to college, uh, Fort Collins at CSU. And I took a few years off mushrooming and, and foraging, sort of forgot all about it from the college stuff and then got back into it really heavily towards the end of my college career. And then, um, you know, I majored in natural resource management. So, you know, very much plant centric and um, got really back into mushroom hunting and then started learning the plants and, you know, had a desire to share what I was learning and help people learn because I enjoyed it so much. So I started Forage Colorado in 2015. And it's just okay. been, you know, when I have time work to work on it, I, I'll, Put some effort into it and slowly growing. So, so here's your website. I'm throwing it up on the screen for everybody. Yeah. Beautiful photos. Thank you. I just did some spring cleaning on the website and updated things. So yeah. I'll just give everybody the quick rundown here. If they visit your site, not only all the nice photos of the, the stuff you're foraging, um, but there's a lot of really nice blog posts in here as well. And yeah, more, more coming. Yep. A special note is all of the uh, really good morel content here. Certainly the best in the state. Um, just great content. So I would encourage anybody that wants to kind of get up to speed on this. ForageColorado.com is a, is a great place to visit. And that's, that's Orion's website. Yeah. Um, the other place we see Orion all the time is on Facebook. You're really active in the, in the mushroom groups. Yeah. And that's part of my like, trying to help people learn and, and, you know, being passionate about helping people learn this stuff. One, um, you know, someone who's recognizable is, you know, has some knowledge on it, who's always active and helping people, you know, you gain that reputation and then people, you know, look to you for advice and, and I enjoy that. But two, it also helps me, um, you know, it, it gives me repetition of seeing mushrooms over and over and over again and, and learning them really well in plants too. But, you know, mushrooms are really kind of my passion. So. That's why I'm so active on the mushroom pages. Just waiting for Kristen to jump in there. <laughs> hey, everyone. <laughs> I'm glad you all are here. 
And, uh, um, the other thing I wanted to note for the chat, I don't know, do they have to switch theirs to all attendees for everyone to see it if they want to talk with, with each other? Um, yeah. I'm seeing some messages maybe. just to the panelists, which is us three. Okay, let me switch that over. It might be something that they can do too. I don't know. Got it. So, uh, um, Trent, we might want to jump in and just say hey to everyone uh, in case people don't know who you and I are. Because um, we might have some new folks joining us, which if we do, that's awesome. Uh, Trent and I are, are the, the two people that run modernforager.com. And um, you may or may not have seen us blogging and talking about our foraging adventures. But we are also mushroom obsessed just like uh, many of you probably are, um, chomping on the bit to get out there and find some um, wild asparagus and uh, morels soon, hopefully. Um, but it's uh, awesome to have all you guys here tonight. So hopefully we'll be able to share some really great stuff about spring forage. So yeah, excited. Definitely. Yeah, so I was hoping we could uh, maybe start with a little bit on on some of the green stuff you're you're looking for right now, uh, yeah. we have some pictures to share, and then we'll come into mushrooms later. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, really, we're we're pretty early in the the spring green still, um, and I'm actually working on a blog post about this right now. So that'll be up in the next few days, maybe. Um, but you know, like late April, May, there's just an abundance of spring, you know, greens and plants available as well as the mushrooms. Um, the stuff that's up right now um, that I've been foraging a lot of are like mustard greens. Um, dandelions are really common. I don't forage a lot of dandelions. Um, dock plants like curly dock is a really common one. Um, salsify and um, there's a handful of others that are just getting started. So we can kind of look at a few of those. Yeah, let's take a look at some of them. Um, how about how about we start with, with Doc? Yeah. Um, only because, I, I don't know, I, I like Doc. Yeah, Doc's great. It's a really common plant. This plant is like, you'll see this everywhere. Um, it, it It's, the plant that has, oh, somebody's asking for all attendees. Chat for you. Yeah. Trent, can you, you guys, do that? Do you know how to do that? What's chat, that? You, the people in chat may be able to do it themselves. That's what I had to do. Um, Jasmine is asking, and I can't. While you are sharing the screen, I can't get to my controls. But Jasmine would like us to set chat so that everyone can talk to each other. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, this is our first webinar, so um, I thought it was already set that way. Where in the Thank two you. in the two field, do you get to pick who you chat to, and you can chat to all panelists and attendees before you submit your chat? Does that work for you? Oh, look at this! Allow ah, uh, you know what? I had the power that whole time. Chat the whole time. Chat away. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Yay. Oh, there we go. So that's okay, what yeah, the that's doc, that's what it looks like from the distance. Yeah, so once you learn this plant, even a little bit, you'll start seeing it mm -hmm. literally everywhere. Like a weed. Yeah, it's these green bunches, and then later in the summer and fall, they send up these stalks that you can see in that picture, that last picture. And um, yeah, in the Oh, they're like a rusty brown color and they're super, super noticeable. Um, so right now what we're looking for, if you want to switch to that, the one with the knife in it. Um, okay. that one. For the greens, you're kind of looking for these like freshly sprouted leaves. Um, the curled up leaves are the best uh, or the recently uncurled and that's what I'm showing in this. Yeah, picture. like this one right here is money, right? Yep, and the, the one on the right is good too. Um, once they get, you know, fully matured, they get a little tough and bitter. So these yeah. are um, really what you want. Any special preparation advice for people? There's a full handful. So um, with Doc, it's a Rumex species. Um, that's R-U-M-E-X. Um, these all have 
ox oxalates like uh, spinach does, mm -hmm. other you know common vegetables do. They're the oxalates. Just be aware of that. Don't overindulge on dock. Um, and what I like to do is just kind of chop them up and saute them, or you know add them to stir fries, add them into really anything that you would use spinach for. They're great. They have a little bit of like a, a tangy flavor. Um, you know, like a, like a sorrel or some of the other rumex, if anyone's familiar with those. But, um, what happens if you overindulge on doc? Uh, ox, <laughs> oxalates can cause um, kidney stones. Oh, okay. So but, yeah, you don't want to, it's just oxalates in general. You know, spinach has a lot of oxalates. Okay. Bell peppers have a lot of oxalates. There's a lot of plants that have oxalates. <laughs> okay, let's not overindulge. Yeah, where, yeah. Where, where, what kind of terrain are you finding finding these guys in? Any, anywhere in particular? No, they grow everywhere. Like yeah. that picture that Looks. you were looking at there was along a little like drainage ditch. Um, disturbance areas, construction sites. You know, obviously, be smart about it. They're urban. They're these are very much an urban weed. So you know. Yeah. Things that were sprayed. Okay. Um, yeah, same places. It. Same places you might find asparagus. Yeah. Uh, the, only, the only look-alike that I know is um, a plant called um, hound's tongue, and it, it's it's fuzzy, got fuzzy leaves. And if you want to, Trent, if you want to pull up the picture showing the uh, the dock slime, doc has this weird leaf. There it is. There it is and it's like weird gooey slime around the base of the petioles. And um, you, that will immediately tell you that it's dock if you're, if you're questioning. It's, it's slimy and sticky and gooey. It's not harmful or anything and it washes right off, but it's a good identifier. Yeah. Cool. Which do we look at next? Um, let's look at the, the musk mustard. Okay. This is another plant that's super common right now. Okay, we've got two, two pictures of that. Yep, so this plant is also everywhere. It's a, it's a non-native weed, as is curly dock, the one that we just went over. Um, this plant is, is the one that some people are pretty allergic to, the, the pollen, and it's got like a kind of a musky, funky smell. Some people describe it as um, like sweaty feet or... <laughs> It's got like a musky earthy <laughs> smell. Delightful. It's one of, yeah, it's one of my favorite mustards. It's kind of got like an earthy flavor in addition to the mustard green flavor. Um, it really is quite good. How do you harvest this guy? So you're going to want to, if any spring greens, you're going to want um, young tender parts. So you can see here, I've got a fistful of like the top three, four inches of plants. Um, if it's growing fast, it's going to be tender. So in areas where there's, they're getting water, they're getting a lot of light, you know, if they've gone to flower, that means that, you know, they've, they've grown pretty fast. Um, you know, if they're not very tall. Um, but again, these are everywhere. Um, you'll see fields and fields of these just all over, you know, urban areas, front range type habitat, and even up into the foothills. And um, for, for identifying these guys, aside from the smell, um, they've got those, those little purple cross flowers. So all the flowers are edible. Yep, all parts of this plant are edible. All, all mustard family plants are edible. Um, and it's a very large family. Some are better, this one is one of the good ones. You wanna get these in the spring when they're, when they're young? Yeah, you, I mean, in the fall or in the late summer when they've gone to seed, you can, the uh, you can harvest the seed and, and make you know like homemade mustard with it, grind and, and make mustard um, with any mustards. You can do that. But um, I wanted to just point out these these flowers. These are very characteristic of mustard family plants. Four petals, and then if you had a, a you know a little hand lens, you would be able to look into the flower and you'll see this the stamens. They have six of them. Four are tall and two are short, and that's characteristic of every mustard plant. Okay, great. Greens like wild mushrooms you want to cook. You can eat, you can eat these raw. I like them raw and cooked. Um, dock, you probably 
you, you can eat it raw too, it's fine. You just don't want to eat too much of it. The cooking helps break down the oxalates for doc. Um, but yeah, all of these are, are good raw or, or cooked. I just like this cook. That's a thing that a lot of people have lost, you know, doing practicing and, and it's, it's a really good technique okay. for preparing lots of greens. Yeah, cooking them. Yep. Hey, Orion, uh, so we have some, a few questions in here. People want to know if there are troublesome lookalikes to some of these. Yep, I hit, I hit that one with the dock. I've got the chat up too. Okay. Um, uh, the hound's tongue was the only one that I've seen that kind of looks similar. Um, the slime will, the slime will cover that. And then the, uh, the cooking, um, the flowers are edible. All parts of the mustards are edible and, um, yeah, cook or raw for the musk mustard. Do you want to take a look at the garlic mustard while we're sure. on, yeah. while we're on mustards? Yeah. So this is another mustard. Let's do, um, let's go to the, the sprout. That one? Mustard, yeah, it's must. yep, that one. Okay. Yeah, musk mustard is super, super common. So I, w I wouldn't be surprised if many of yeah. these are. This is the garlic mustard though, right? Yeah, this plant, yeah, I'm, I'm replying to a, a chat comment. Oh, okay, okay, oh, yeah. Sorry, um, yeah, so this plant here is garlic mustard and this is another, uh, another invasive mustard. Um, this one grows a little bit later. So these were taken about, two weeks ago, week and a half ago, this picture. Um, they're just starting to sprout. But um, this plant is, it's really common in the west or in the east and the, the midwest. It, it's kind of just takes over river areas and, and woodland areas. Um, and you can see, I've got like a little progression um, marked by years. I took in 2018 a picture. So that's, there. there's 2018. That's what the patch looked like. The fall oh was the next picture. Wow. So it that's how, yep, that's how quickly this plant can take over. And it, um, it secretes a compound into the soil that reduces the ability for other plants and mushrooms to grow. Some people call that poison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ella, I find these in riparian areas mostly. Um, they do grow in like wooded areas in other states, but here in Colorado, I've only seen them in riparian areas along rivers. It's kind of a theme here. A lot of the, a lot of the stuff you're looking for is in this, this habitat, isn't it? Yeah, so spring, like April through June, if you just go into riparian areas, you can pick loads of stuff. Just, yeah. I mean, there's endless amounts of stuff. You know, that's where the water is. There's shade, there's trees. It's just, it hasn't been affected by urban development as much. Okay. Are there are there anything with garlic here, garlic mustard? We need to look at more. It looks like here's a close up. Yeah, so this is the mature plant, and you can see um, you can see the leaves are very different from the sprout that he showed earlier. And there again, you can see the four petaled flower uh, that's characteristic of the mustard flam family. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you imagine that those flowers were all closed like the other ones, you can kind of see the resemblance to broccoli, which is another mustard family plant. Yeah. Um, and again, like all mustards, all the parts are edible. And this one is a very strong, like very pungent, garlicky onion flavor with the mustard green flavor. So it's it's a pretty cool plant. I like using it in like pestos or chimichurri. Um, you can chop it up and you know add it to stuff where you want that garlic flavor. Okay, so just a little bit more of a more of a kind of a highlight highlight green to add to to a salad or a. Or, yeah, or yeah, it's pretty pungent. So pesto you type wanna, dish. Yeah, you wouldn't want to go like full meal of garlic mustard, but um, you know, a mix of other greens. It's a good flavor. Like I said, okay. pestos are really good to make with this. I've made um, a garlic mustard pesto pizza before. That's pretty good. Sounds delicious. It does. Um, what else do we have here? We've looked at dock. We've looked at garlic. We've got a couple we've, pictures of salsify. If you want to. Yeah, that. let's definitely look at salsify there it is yeah so this was the last snow we had which was a couple weeks ago um this plant is is also a very common weed and, and the cool thing about many of these plants that we're talking about and salsify in particular um is that we're brought in you know when 
the states were settled. So they were brought in as edible and medicinal plants from Europe and they've since escaped and naturalized. So um, this plant is still cultivated in some parts of Europe uh, for its large edible taproot, which you'll see in the next photo. But um, you know, the features of this plant and the, the reason that it's sort of under harvested or underutilized is because it's initially a little bit hard to tell apart from grass. You know, that kind of looks like a little patch of grass, but it's actually a rosette. Um, and there, there are the edible roots there. Uh -huh. They're common in gardens too, aren't they? Like as a, yeah, you pull them out of your garden like they're they a weed. Everywhere. And if, if people don't know, um, this plant is the plant that gets like the large dandelion-like puff. Yeah. Well flowers. Um, Can you still, is there a time yeah, frame yeah. when you want to forage it? Like these when they're young versus when it has that giant flower on it? Can you eat the root at any time? The roots are best. Um, like most root, edible roots, um, you want to eat those in like fall, winter, or early spring. You know, oh, okay. they're storing the sugars down in the roots. Um, once they start producing greens and flowers and setting up a flower stock, they're putting their energy into that and the roots are gonna be tougher and, and you know, not as flavorful. Did we miss the boat, do you think, on these already this year? No, I think we're still okay. Um, you can, I would say you could harvest roots until they start setting up a flowering stock, which, you know, soonish, but you know, just because you can't harvest the roots, does, the roots doesn't mean you've missed it. The greens are great. The, my favorite part are the flower buds um, before uh -huh. the end of the puffs. So the flowers will open. The, these ones have a yellow flower. We have three species in Colorado. But this is the most common. Um, and then they'll close back up and turn into that big puff. So you can kind of, if you're not sure, just peel the flower open and look. If it's yellow, then it's good. That's a flower bud. And, and those are really good. Um, and Someone wants to know if lily turf is common. another name for salsify. You know, I don't know. The, um, Google it. This, <laughs> the uh, genera there, Trigopogon. So there's Trigopogon. scientific names. So, um, um, on that note, let's talk about like you had to go look something up. What, what books do you like to use for your, your wild greens? Yeah, so um, on my website link there, there's a, I added a resource page this year. I've done a list of some stuff. But I have a pretty extensive um, collection of foraging books and cooking books and mushroom books. But um, the, uh, those first ones for plants, the Forager's Harvest books, Forager's Harvest, Nature's Garden, and Incredible Wild Flowers by Samuel Thayer. Yeah. Um, those are the best plant books. They're not Colorado specific, they're North American specific, but they are the best ones, in my opinion, and in many other people's opinions. Sam is uh, one of my friends. Um, he's become one of my friends in recent years. And he's just, he's, very, very good at explaining, you know, how to how to learn plants and where to find them and the identification and how to use them. Those, those books are great. Um, yeah. Loaded and, question here. Where do you, uh, where, where and when do you go to get access to this world? What's that? Like what, what festival do you attend? I know oh. there's a, I know there's a, that was a lead up to a pretty cool event. Yeah. So, um, um, Sam and his wife Melissa put on an event called the Midwest Wild Harvest Festival every year. This year is pending, you know, with COVID, but um, it's it's a you know buy tickets and go, and it's it's in Wisconsin every year. Um, and what they do is it's like a long weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They have a bunch of different teachers in various um, categories, and then they get um, a chef to um make food for the entire weekend and then last year and this year and the year before i believe it's um alan berger alan. forager chef yeah and he caters the entire event with wild food so you, you get to eat well <laughs> yeah eat yeah. well and you learn a ton and, and you know sam and melissa are great and everyone there is great um so i got to go for the first time last year and i met adam harrison as well with uh, learn your land who's Awesome. Who has am amazing videos, by the yeah, way. Yeah, his YouTube channel is great. Yeah. 
Okay. So, but for plants, those would be my, my recommended books would be Sam's books. I'm going to throw one any, in there. Sorry, did you have Kristen. any photos of the uh, salsify flower? Someone wanted to know. I didn't, I don't have any. I didn't find any in my library. Um, if you just Google that tragopogon, you'll see it. They're, they're super common. I was going to throw up a, a book. Um, I don't know if that's yeah. backwards when you look at it. Is everything reversed? No, it's the, good. Oh, good. No, the, wild, okay. the Wild Wisdom of Weeds, Katrina Blair. She's a, uh, a Colorado native here. And uh, that's a good book, too, if, you, if you're looking for a, a good read on weeds, edible weeds. <laughs> Yeah. Most of the plants that I harvest are weeds. Mm -hmm. And like I said, a lot of them are brought here as food or medicine by the settlers. So, Oh, and we're going to, uh, before we jump to your next plant, I think we have one more to look at here. Nettle, Kristen had a plant for you to ID for us okay. oh. that we got recently. Oh, yeah. Some feral asparagus. <laughs> uh, totally feral. I had to chase it down. Yeah, is that coming up over by you guys? Uh, it, we found some yesterday in our very early season spot, which is okay. usually a week or two, a week or two yeah. sometimes prior to everywhere else. So. Usually in, in Fort Collins here, we're like mid, mid to late April, depending on what the snow does. So. Yeah, we have uh, the best picking is probably two or three weeks away, if not longer for asparagus. Yep, yeah. But we do have one one spot that for some reason goes huh. earlier than all the rest. And it's like every year of thermal activity under it and warms up faster. I don't know. I don't know We're why. just lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the plants there too are very old. They're super sure. big stocks. Yeah, so. big crowns and mm -hmm, yeah, got a yeah. couple spots like that. Yeah. If, if we want to talk about asparagus, we sure could. Oh, we should talk about asparagus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, like I said, it's feral asparagus. Most people call it wild asparagus, but it's actually the same exact species that you buy in the store. And the reason that it's out in the wild is because it's escaped cultivation. So it's feral. It's escaped. Um, do you know? Do you know how it escaped to all those fence rows, Orion? I, I have a theory. Yeah, usually it's birds. Oh, you already have, yeah. you heard my theory. Yeah, they, they eat the seeds and, you know. Yeah, people always say like, oh, they're along the ditches. That's where they, they go. And I think what they're really, they're along the f old fences. Fences, that yeah. They happen to be along a ditch and birds poop the seeds out on those fences. Exactly, yeah. That's my theory. I'm, I'm yeah, sticking to it. Fence lines, um, you know, if you want to <clears throat> find asparagus, just drive county roads and look along the fence rows. Yeah. Yep. We, we Johnny Appleseed a few of them too out uh, along the, <laughs> nice. the roads in our, in our neighborhood as well. Just to, you know, help them out a little bit and have a little more to pick. Once you start getting really good at spotting them, like I can spot them going uh, far down the highway. Yep. Do you get really good. You'll see them everywhere. They Do we have any uh, photos, Trent, of old asparagus stalks that we can show? Uh, I do, but by the time I dig them up, we'll be on to morels or something. So, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you got to learn to spot. The secret go, is though. Uh, check out your post on, on Modern Forager. Yeah, yeah it okay, is. Well, it is. There is a blog post on modernforager.com. If you just go there and search asparagus. I'm overdue for writing a post about asparagus. Trent, do this, but uh, uh, where we sort of show, just go search Trent top, top right there, type in asparagus. There we go. She says she has to tell me how to how to work our site. I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of new to this whole internet web thing. Yeah. That's the, I love this picture. I can't believe like she laid asparagus on the hood of her car. We were dating at this point. I'm like, oh, this is wrong. And she took a picture, and it's like the best picture of asparagus ever on the, on the, on the hood of her old Ford. Yeah. Um, here we go. Scroll down. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you might be able to click on that. Maybe, I don't know, to make it bigger. Maybe not. Oh, there you go. Ta -da. Yeah, that's like the telltale sign right there, everyone, to finding asparagus is, you know, not only finding um, old fences along f irrigated farmland, but looking for these old stalks. Um, that's, a, that's a spring, that's a spring look. In the fall and winter, yep. they look like that, but they're bright gold. So if you think ahead. Okay, yeah. 
That's when we yep. find ours. All the, if you want to find asparagus, you got to do it in August and September. Yeah. That's when you can just see them a mile away sticking up. But if you do find these old stalks, asparagus uh, grow in the same spot every year. So you can just kind of move the grass aside and look at the base of those stalks and you'll see new shoots coming up. Yep. Um, there might be a few other photos in there, Trent, that you scroll to the bottom, maybe showing some of the new shoots popping. Um, strangely enough, as asparagus grow just like they look uh, in the grocery store. Just yep. like this, sometimes, they grow as a stock, one stock right out of the ground. Sometimes Please. much larger too. I should have sent yeah. you a trophy asparagus Actually, picture I have. Here's a fat one from yesterday. There you go. Yeah, that's kind of a fun. It's so weird. We call them ditch dinner because literally they are growing right in the ditch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're super fun and absolutely delicious. They are super good. Uh, does someone wants to know if burning the ditch affects the root? It shouldn't. I no. don't think so either. Yeah. No, it, no, it doesn't affect it at all. There's a, 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 a lot of people talk about how deep they need to bury their asparagus when they plant it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's only yeah, to keep, the crowns. Yeah. And that's only to keep people with, with, with their, their, what do they farmers use? Tills or plows, hoes. Yeah from damaging the asparagus to get That'll it down deeper. You don't have to actually plant it that deep. Uh, burning, as far as I could tell, it's, it's a good thing. It burns away the old stuff and the new ones pop right up and they're really easy to see. Yeah, uh, Zachary, and the, and the, there's yeah, no, no really lookalikes for asparagus. I and mean, if you know what asparagus looks like in a grocery store, you're, you're good to go on asparagus. Once it gets mature, it probably will be a little unfamiliar. It's got like a bunch of yeah. feathery berries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could see I could see people picking those horsetails, um, which kind of look seen like asparagus. Do that. But I mean, it, they're not going to eat them. Yeah, it's going to be an exact match to asparagus. I actually I think that those horsetails are edible, but that's beside the point. Um, I will really I will hungry. say there are quite a few sort of dead stalks that will trick you. They look there's that's a lot true. of stuff yep. that looks like asparagus that is not, um, and I think a lot of those kind of weedy stalks come out of the ground in sort of like a um, a bunch like this, whereas asparagus stalks come out singularly out of the ground. Um, but once you kind of get to know them, they're super easy to pick can out. You, can you answer that question in the chat too? Um, Cutting rather than pulling? Cut Neither. or snap? Cut or snap? I snap. I'm a snapper. Yeah. Yeah, they just snap. Here, I'm going to snap one for you. Just like that, they're really easy to snap off. Yeah, and that, that snap technique um, gives you all of the tender part, so you don't have to deal with the like fiber base. Uh, but cut, true. you can peel the fiber, you know, with like a, a carrot peeler or whatever. Yep. Yeah, and then you get some more. All right. Um, let's talk, let's keep, keep moving here. Let's hit nettles yep. so we have enough time to really dive into morels after okay. this. Uh, uh, nettles. nettles are exciting. You have several pictures here. I'll start with a sprout picture. Oh, baby nettles. It looks kind of like the mustard from here. Yeah, a little bit, yeah, but they've got those little hairy uh, stinger. Yeah. Um, and garlic mustard won't have those. Yeah. Um, Um, I'm going to touch on a question real quick. Ella, um, Santa Fe should have the same, uh, you know, riparian areas and or fence lines for asparagus. I'm actually from Santa Fe. <laughs> oh, that's why probably the question got put in there because you mentioned Maybe. that earlier on. Okay. Maybe. We actually had a feral asparagus growing in our yard in Santa Fe. Um, yeah, so nettles. Um, this is my favorite. Um, I'm actually drinking nettle tea right now. Um, yeah. This is, I love this plant so much that I'm actually going to cultivate it this year. Um, really? Yeah. I want to have just like, a, you know, whatever I need it. Just that's, I love that idea. That's, stash it away. You know, we're that's a great idea. A garden and I'm just like, I'm going to grow some wild plants and the first one is going to be nettles. So um, that way I, you know, sustainably harvest my wild patches and have enough to put away for teas and yeah whatever else yeah because they're perennials that come they come up again and again right in the same yep, spot yep, don't they? they come back every year so these guys were like an inch tall they're tiny little nettles and this is like you know late april may into you know all summer you can harvest them 
and really even after they go to seed, you can harvest them. But I would I would stick to using them for tea after they've gone to seed. So, so that's, here's some some bigger ones. This is yep. this must be a month from now because look, I mean, theoretically, Indeed, yeah. yeah, that's about a month from you know that's a month of growth or so. Yeah. And, you know the mature plants they're they're pretty characteristic and if you're questioning just uh you know touch the back of your hand to them and you'll learn real quick at all if you're brave if you're brave yeah i kind of like thing. i don't mind it too much it's, it's talk about that a little bit because i think a lot of people out there like me probably i, w I was terrified to pick nettles for the yeah. first time so i mean um, if you're worried about it just put on some gardening gloves and use scissors and you know, i'm gonna get my nettle picking tool i'll be right back yeah, yeah go get okay. the tool will you um <laughs> so nettles stinging net stinging nettles it's urtica dioca um they have little tiny syringe like hairs and when when you you know touch them to your skin they break off and they irritate and they create a welt um, and urtica you know like urticaria is you know like an allergy that causes welts so that's where they get their their genus name um and you know gloves cooking cooking completely cooking or drying completely neutralizes the the stinger um, also macerating right yeah you can you can you know pulverize in a pestle or i I've seen Sam, um, you know, roll the outside of the leaf so that it's all around the, because the stingers are only on the bottoms and the stems. I've yeah. seen Sam like roll the leaf in and, and crunch, crush it up and eat them raw. But I don't, I don't know that I'd recommend that because. I have, I've also seen too though, Katrina Blair, especially when she makes her green drink, if you put nettles into a blender, that's enough okay. maceration. Yep. That's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, sure. I think yeah, to so, get think fresh nettle. Yeah. yeah. Show me your nettle. Here's my, here's my picking tool. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and you can like uh, snap off the top little bit of each nettle with that. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you come across a nettle patch like you're seeing on the screen here, mm -hmm. um, um, I would be picking, you know, sustainably harvest. You know, you don't want to take the whole patch. Leave some to go to seed and keep spreading the nettles and growing your patches. Um, I would harvest like about 30% of this, and I would only harvest like the top three, four, maybe five nodes if they're really tender. And the nodes are, you know, where each leaf pair is coming out. So you might get a, you might be picking them about that, that big? Yeah, like five, four, five, six inches, something like that. Okay, yeah, we see your tongs, Kristen, thank you. Well, people that's are asking, some, that's people, are asking <laughs> people are asking <laughs> to see it. This is salad just tongs. a set of kitchen tongs I know. That, a chef, that a chef would use. That's why I'm well, holding them like, up. Show, um, show them how they are, work. People show, are saying, yeah. show me the tool. Show them <laughs> yeah. how they work. Here's the so tool. you squeeze them. <laughs> Can you show them usually, the dance too? Usually, there's, if you get two of them, there's a dance. No. Okay. I wish I could <laughs> Thank you, Orion. You know squish what your head. About. But um, so, um, usually, Orion, we pick like, like the top four or five inches of that plant. Yep. Is that what you do? Yep, that's what we were just talking about. The nose, Sorry. top four-ish <laughs> nodes. Um, you were busy playing with your tongs when he said that. <laughs> Yep. Elizabeth is, is seconding the recommendation of gloves. Definitely, like, if you don't know what these stings feel like, just wear gloves. It's not, you know. I just go get stung. It's not such a big deal. But, like, you should try They're not it fun once. either. No, they're not fun either, though. You should though. try and, it and once just to understand. And there's actually, it's actually um, therapeutic. There are some, like, benefits from getting stung. And there's people that do it on purpose. There's Yeah, yeah. Uh, you get to learn how to deal with pain. In Europe. Um, you know, there's people that eat them raw and did you say metal festivals in Europe? There's that too, but <laughs> metal festivals. Did you say there's such a thing as a nettle festival in yes. Europe? Sure, yes, sure, why not? We should yeah. start a nettle festival. Yeah, that'd be great. I think to Elizabeth's point too, though, some people can have much yeah. more of a reaction than That's other people. That's what I was going to say. Some people can yeah. be allergic to this and, and it might be very painful, um, you know, very painful. So, you know, be careful. If you're concerned, just wear gloves. They're not gonna, yeah. All right, All right. people want to get you back on topic here and find out about how else you cook it and what it tastes like and all that good stuff. I'm just going to tell a quick story before yeah. we answer everybody's <laughs> important questions. I had my some, first experience with nettles 
Um, and I was fishing in Virginia. I was wearing like shorts and a t-shirt because it's hot in Virginia. And I'm walking along this river and I'm fishing, I'm fishing. I'm like, ah, oh, what is, what is wrong? Like, I'm just getting more and more uncomfortable. And I knew what they were from Michigan. And I looked down and I realized I am in, I mean, I was like in the middle of a football field with the river on one side and the nettle was waist high and I had to get out of it. Cause I, it seems like after it touches you, it takes a few minutes to start. It's not like instant. It and I was deep bit, in this yep. field and, and I spent, I did spend hours just in, in discomfort. Um, yeah. Stung. I can imagine being like stung all over is not super comfortable, but I, I very rarely pick these with gloves. I, like I said, I don't mind the sting, but there's just put some gloves in your bag and, you know, and bring the tongs. They're so, I mean, <laughs> these nettles are full, full of nutrients, full of protein. They're, they're just, they're such a good plant. Talk and about that. Tastes now. really good. So um, they do, do you prepare? Yeah, they're delicious. I, I always dehydrate some for tea. I'll usually just wrap them in bundles and dry them in the window or whatever, hang them. You can do it in a dehydrator too if you want. Um, and then I just stash them, either crush them up into tea, you know, powder, or just leave them whole and crush them when I want to make tea. Um, aside from tea, you can use them, you know, how like literally any way you can think of. Um, you can make soup out of them. The greens are great. They've got like a very kind of like a savory greens flavor. It's hard to describe. Um, They're substantial. Yeah. If you boil like a large amount of them in water, you get like a really, really flavorful broth. Mm -hmm. uh, like an energy drink. It's really good. It's, good it's great. Broth. Yeah. yeah. You can, um, you know, you Anything you can think of, you can do with these. Um, I've seen people make pasta out of them, which is, you know, you boil the greens and then you, you know, cut them up and mix them into the pasta dough. You can make, I mean, the the, the options are endless, but, um, you know, I boil the greens, I make soups, I make stocks, I make tea a lot, you know, when I have them, but they're just great. It's just, a, like I said, it's one of my favorite plants, probably my favorite plants. Um, it's just a, just a good plant. And it's interesting too, right? It's got this defense mechanism that can sting you and be painful, but it's got all these health benefits and it's, it's just delicious. Um, Jim is asking if that's burdock behind the nettle. Yeah, that was burdock. Um, some people call that wild uh, rhubarb. It's not actually related to rhubarb. But um, yeah, I have eaten burdock. I, I kind of can be a little bit lazy sometimes with foraging and burdock takes some processing. The roots are edible, but you got to dig them out and they're giant and go way deep. And then uh, the stalks, um, you know, like you would use for rhubarb are edible, but you have to peel them. They've got this like really bitter coating skin on them. So you have to peel it off and then, you know, rinse them really well. And then you can use it. It's kind of similar to like a celery stalk or something, but I don't do it very often, but I, I can, I have. I just changed the view for everybody. I don't know if this is different, if you can see a difference. It is different. Um, yeah, I mean, for us, it's just a big, big picture of us. I don't know what they see. They probably see the same thing. I think Carson said it looks like it's fixed, so. Okay, because then I can go back to showing the screen, hopefully. Yeah. Yep, so the burdock is there in the in the back right. Okay. Or like right there. Right, right there. Yep. Yeah, there we go, burdock. That's burdock. Okay. Um, another very common plant. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good stuff here. Let me do um let me do this. Let me um bring that back to us here. Okay. And uh, before we switch into morels, let's just try a quick uh, a quick poll here. Curious where uh, where you all forage. Um, giving you a couple choices here: Front Range, Western Slope. Kind of see what we got going here. Pretty good mix. With, uh, looks like Front Range is bringing it. About sixty percent of you are, are foraging the Front Range, so that's good. Everything here will, will apply. Um, to that. I'm not allowed to vote. No. Me either. <laughs> nice. Okay, let's do, before we go to morales, I have one more question for you all. 
let's do this one, give you all a minute. And see, these are the kind of topics we're talking about today. I'm curious uh, how many people forage for wild greens uh, in the last year. Yellow morales. Notice that is in the last year we're asking. <laughs> Good. So a lot of uh, wild greens and burn morales. Okay, well, thanks everybody for, for sharing. We have, uh, we have that. Can, can everybody else see the results of the polls as they're, as they're going in there like we can? I don't see them. Oh. Um, huh. Wonder how I share the poll. Share results. Did that do it? Yeah, that did. And also someone said would be more accurate if they could vote for all that apply, they could only choose one. For the first one. Yeah. Go oh, Jane. Yeah. Hi, Jane. She's a troublemaker. <laughs> she cool. would have picked, she would have picked all of them. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll just show the other one here since we, we have the ability now that I've learned how to do it. Front range is the winner, except for Jane. She couldn't pick all the others. So. <laughs> all right. All right, you guys, that was good. I see a question about uh, mushroom hunting in Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's, um, you know, mountains. It's very similar to Colorado. You just get up into the, you know, the Santa Fe National Forest or the Santa Fe Ski Basin. Um, there's a lot of people that do that and there's a lot of good mushrooms up there in years where you guys get snow and rain so you talk about two species in that area that we always are wondering about one is um white bolites and yep. the other one is matsutake um, yep. can you go down there is it, is it the motherland of of those white bolites <laughs> um i've heard that it is i have actually never picked white bolites in new mexico i've only picked them in colorado so okay that Colorado has more of them based on my experience, but um, I think that, you know, the, the White Kings like Ponderosa forests. There's a lot of those down in, in the Santa Fe area. Yep, that's Boletus Barazii, as Ella yep. uh, just, just pointed out. Um, last, year, last year was a good year for uh, the White Boletes. Uh, we don't have any photos ready for those right now, Heather, but, um, you know, maybe we'll revisit some of the summer and fall mushrooms. Um, in another uh, in another webinar, yeah. Um, so yeah, Santa Fe area definitely. And then Matsutake, um, if you guys check out my my blog posts, um, last year I wrote a post about Matsutake, and I've actually just started learning those. So I didn't even know they existed when I was a, a young mushroom hunter in New Mexico. Um, I was a little bit um, stubborn about going to look for them because of the habitats they grow in and, and all that. So if you want to learn more, just go check out the, uh, the post on my website. Um, yeah, I'll just show it up in here. It's, yeah, it's learning the most, Matsutake. That's the one. Yeah. Do you like eating uh, those guys? Yeah, they're great. They're really good. They're very unique. They're such a unique flavor that they have. So yeah, we, we refer to them as the cilantro of mushrooms because I feel like you sure. either love them or you hate them. Sure. Yeah. I love them, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. I and do you can't too, yeah. you can find Matsutake in Colorado if you are super lucky. It does happen. Lucky or, yeah. or skilled or or skilled or yeah. Find a group of Japanese people picking them like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just, that's just, hang, yeah. just hang out with us. Well we know some great Matsutake spots. Hey shh. shh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we talk about morels now? I think uh, I think this is yeah. kind of the the headline here uh, for those of you that don't know uh, or or maybe missed the earlier part of this. Orion is is really known internationally as a Colorado morel expert. Um, he may not know that, but uh, I, I didn't know that. Yes, he is definitely a Colorado morel expert, and and I think just as importantly, Orion, you're like really generous. You you have written up like articles about it and taken pictures and told everybody everything. And, and I kind of laugh because 
people are like, well, where do I go? And it's like, I mean, you describe it to the T and everything you yeah, write. Yeah, if you just can put like, like, you know, I don't know, it's seven posts. It probably would take you like an hour or two to really read and, and get mm -hmm. to understand and, you know, you learn. I've had a lot of people who've read through all of them and they're like, I went out the next year and found more else. So. Yeah. Oops, I went too far. Let me go back and just show everybody that. Uh, I think if it, it's here, the Colorado Morel series um, is where you have all the information about morels. Yep. Um, and I would start all the way down here in the introduction and read that. Um, or just hang out for the next, you know, 20 minutes. Why don't you, why yeah. don't you start on the yellows? and This will highlight and that will be comprehensive. So if you want the comprehensive coverage, go, go check those out. Okay. Um, so yeah, yellow morels, we're, get, we're, we're just on the cusp of these guys. Usually like mid, late April is when I start seeing these in my area, which is Fort Collins. Um, southern latitudes, you know, south Colorado, southwestern Colorado might get these a little earlier and eastern Colorado might get these a little earlier because that soil is warming quicker than it is over here in, you know, northern Colorado. And all morels, just to, as a blanket statement, like soil temperatures around 50 degrees and then up to 60 degrees. So that's just like, in general, um, you know, what you want to go for, for morels. So I carry a, um, a, a, a little meat thermometer and I just stick it in. I thought I had it around, but it's packed away in my foraging kit in my car. Um, I just stick it in the soil and if it's 50 degrees, then I'll start looking for morels. If it's not, then then I uh, move on. Um, hey, uh, just to interrupt for a second, someone uh, says they are losing audio. Is anyone else having that issue of, of audio losing? Carrie sent that just to the panelists here. Yeah. No? Okay. 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 Cool. Um, Sorry. Broke up just a little. Just talk softly. You can talk louder or hold my mic up. It, it's probably that time of night when everyone is logging on to Netflix right now. Yeah. <laughs> Connection. No worries. No yeah. worries, Carrie. Thanks for checking that. Um, so yeah, 50 degrees is what we're looking for. So yellow morels, um, like all of the greens that we just talked about, riparian areas are kind of the my go-to spots for these. And um, yeah, way better than Netflix. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's another patch of morels and maybe we can revisit that one when we, when we talk about how well these guys hide. But, um, you know, riparian areas is essentially like a river floodplain, right? So along a river, there's a boundary line where the floodplain is and you know, that's what you want to look for, where you want to look for morels, um, yellow morels. Um, starting about, like I said, mid-April and then you can usually pick these guys into like late May, early June. And um, I often will follow them up into the canyon here in Fort Collins, um, the Poudre Canyon. They will just move up in elevation as the soils, the soil temps reach the, their fruiting temp. So, you know, once it gets 60, once the soil gets to be warmer than 60 degrees in town, I'll just go up into the canyon a little ways and it'll be 55 or 50 and I'll start looking there. So, um, that's kind of how you can follow these up in elevation before you switch to the black morels. And then as far as habitat, um, you know, the things that I would recommend would be like cottonwoods and grassy areas. That's sort of like the two general things. And that's pretty broad. Here's a good picture of like a, what that's, that's a great picture. Riparian habitat would look like. Imagine um, how hard it is to find those little guys amongst yeah. all that grass. So my number, my number one tip, for morels is go slow. <laughs> like that cannot be stressed enough. You think you're going slow, go slower. Um, huh. Sometimes I think just sit down. Sit down, they hide <laughs> Sit so down well. and look around. Yep. Or go to the so, bathroom. Or go you to the bathroom, find, yeah. You always find P them when exactly. you go to the bathroom. <laughs> the very first morels I ever found in Colorado, I um, stopped to, to take a, a potty break. So. Yep. <laughs> but, um, it's it's crazy how well these things hide and, and blend in and, and yeah. you can see that grass they're not going to grow taller than that grass so you got to spot them in the grass 
So is this when you took this picture, were they out at the time? Um, I think it was a touch early. Because I, I think it's interesting how tall the grass is right there, too. Yeah, I think it may have you been know. like a, a week or a few days early because based on the leaf, you know, like how, that. how much the yeah. leaves are out. Like, look how tall that grass is. Yeah, yep. And that may have been, you know, so 50 to 60 degrees. Um, that may have been, that tall grass may have been later, you know, a later flush. Still, it's pretty. It's definitely more grass than we have here right now. Our grass is just just starting. Um, even on the side of the road, it's probably only that tall, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Really, the key is soil temps. You know, if if an area is getting sun, you know, it might warm up faster than an area that doesn't get as much sun. So. You tie that into as well. Uh, what about the type of leaves or some other natural indicators, um, like the, any any kind of things you look for? to know you're in the right season or the right time of year? Um, just in general, like, you know, I, I just kind of go off like either the soil temps if I'm checking them or people posting online. I'm so active on Facebook that I see when people post Colorado morels and I'm like, okay, I guess it's time to go check my spots now. There we go. Yeah. Um, and that's something I mentioned. Um, Jane, the soil, um, soil isn't super affected by variable weather. It holds heat really, really well. And, um, you know, you may lose a degree or two in that surface soil. But once that soil hits 50, it's, it's going to take a lot to get it to cool below 50. And, and I even find morels sometimes at like 47 or 48, some little, you know, early, early risers. Yeah. When's the we best time of day to take the temp? I just in take the morning, time. but whenever yeah, you're in the out. afternoon would probably be best. Um, just like four inches down is fine for soil temp. Um, That's what we do. We stick it pretty far. We probably stick always stick it that far into the ground. Yeah, and we try whole, to know, do it at the same of the time probe. of day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's funny, even when you like try, like if you keep finding little morels and stick them next to each morel, there's a pretty big, still a pretty good little temperature variance. I mean, it could go from Definitely. 47 to 55 um, in, in one day in one area. So there is yeah. some variance as well. There's a couple of questions. Um, fly fishing on the pooter, you, you can look close to the water, but you, they don't always grow right next to the water. That big patch that was on the screen a minute ago with like two feet off the water. Um, uh, that one? You definitely would have seen that fishing, but it's not always the case. Wow, yeah. Um, there are, I don't believe there are mushroom sunglasses. I haven't experienced that. But <laughs> I wish. <laughs> check it out. Nick, if you, no. if you test that, let me know. Um, yeah. But you should just, wear a mask. Yes, wear, wear a mask and go. Um, Terry, was this photo along the pooter? I can't say. <laughs> and um, I think that's all of them. Oh, okay. It is after rain. Yeah, rain, rain helps definitely. Mushrooms like moisture, right? Um, the snow that we're getting right now in northern Colorado has got got me excited for next week. But uh, mm. the nice thing about morels is if we have a decent, if we have had a decent snow year, they don't really need the rain like if we get a lot of rain in, in april and may they'll fruit better for sure but it's not always necessary um it's all you know mushrooms in general that's a good rule um really a few days after rain is a good just always a good time to look for mushrooms for sure um and then carrie asks uh if i find some and leave them and come back that's that's definitely something i'll do if they're tiny i'll leave them to grow Sometimes the deer will eat them. Sometimes someone else will pick them, but that's how it goes. Really? You've seen deer chomping on morels? Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I've seen deer eat like a whole patch of morels before. That's interesting. It's it, but you can see the, their beds and their prints and stuff. I've definitely seen them eating porcini and other mushrooms yeah, later in the summer, them. but... I've never hmm. seen them eat the, eat the morels before. Yeah. Um, 
What so, do you think uh, when you when you look at these? How what from a lifestyle standpoint? How long are they gonna are they gonna hang around and be pickable? It, that kind of depends on you know the climate. So if it's kind of dry, um, you know they'll dry out faster, and you know they'll they won't last around hang around as long. But um, you know in a in a, in a regular year, morels will probably be you know, a week or two before they kind of get too mature and, and dry out. Mm -hmm. okay. Do they come in like in a, in a, do you find they come in a flush in one area and then they're kind of done or might they kind of keep, keep coming up in one area for, for a longer period of yeah, time? Yeah. So if, con if conditions are right, they'll fruit in the same area as long as the soil temps and the conditions are what they need. Right. So 50 to 60 degrees roughly and moisture, they'll, they'll continue to fruit, but um, usually like one to two flushes is what I see. Um, and if you find morels, stop right where you are and scan very slowly all around you because there are always, always more. It's very rare to find a single morel. Yeah, that is rare. I, I, would, I would tend to agree with you on that. If you only found one and you just, you didn't see the others. Yeah, it's very rare. Do you find when there's one in an area, uh, or or you find several, is that is that whole general area then a better area? Like, is there is there do they tend to grow in? Yeah, that's zones? that's definitely something that can happen. Um, you know, it might be some sort of tree that they're associating with. It might just be the soil, you know, the soil mixture of you know the amount of sand and loam is right for them. It, it could just be that that's where they've established over the years. Um, but yeah, if you find them, <clears throat> go back every year, check around the, the, you know, the near vicinity for sure. Um, we got a couple questions in here. One about the mm -hmm. risk of mushrooms containing toxins from the environment. I'll just throw this out there. Yeah, for sure. Morels yeah. will absolutely pull up toxins from the soil. Um, including especially heavy metals. Um, and there's a fair bit of research on that, that the, the uh, uh, um, pesticides and fertilizers they used in old, old apple orchards over, over decades collect in the soil and then they go into the mushrooms and, and you would potentially eat them. Um, that said, uh, I think the places we're picking are probably not rich in these sort of toxins like you would in an old apple orchard. I, I wouldn't pick in an old apple orchard. I wouldn't pick in a golf course. Yeah, um, mushrooms are really good at picking things up and filtering them. You know, oyster mushrooms break down diesel fuel really well. That's mm -hmm. a, a bioremediation study that was done by Paul Stamens. And it's pretty amazing what they can do. So yeah, I mean, they'll definitely pick up some of that stuff. If it's, if it's a sketchy area next to a road or something, I don't, I don't know that I would recommend harvesting them no and they pick it it's funny i think some things they pick up and 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 convert into you know they break it down like like yeah. composting yeah. style Definitely. Um, yeah. other things like especially heavy metals and and maybe radioactivity um uh th these things don't break down they've been sitting in the soil anyways for 20 or 30 or 50 years and the mushrooms will pull those into their flesh yeah where, where you eat them um harvest what about so responsible, responsible harvesting harvest. Orion? so that's a funny one um you know there's in foraging there's this sort of like you know take 30 leave 30 uh for the wildlife leave 30 for you know the more proliferate yeah this was a morel question though yep yep so <laughs> morels don't really mushrooms in general don't really care about that um, you know, and, and it's sort of like a moral thing, right? If you want to leave some and that's what you decide to do, that's fine. Um, I, I'll leave little ones, you know, that's, that aren't worth harvesting and I'll leave really old mature ones. Um, you know, I'll just take the, the best ones. Um, but the mushroom is, it's like picking a berry, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna harm a tree by picking all of the berries off of it. You know, you, you won't leave any seeds to, to drop, but the tree isn't going to be harmed. The cool thing about mushrooms is that as soon as they fruit, they're sending out spores, which is their seed. Um, their mycelium network, which is in the soil, is what they're fruiting from, and that's really the fungal body. And by picking mushrooms or cutting or, or pulling, you're not harming the mycelium at all. So 
you could take every single one, and there's some really extensive mycological studies on this um, done in both Europe and, and I think Oregon, that um, they, they had plots of different mushrooms and they did different testing, like cutting, taking a certain percentage, taking all of them. And the end result was that it, it didn't really matter. Um, in some of the plots where they harvested all of them, you know, they actually got more mushrooms than some of the other plots where they were leaving some. So it, it's kind of up to you uh, uh, to decide on how much you want to harvest. Like I said, I just take, you know, the best ones. I'll leave the little ones. I'll leave the old ones. Um, I just take, you know, the, the prime ones that are good for us to consume. We had a couple questions in there about copper mines and Rocky Mountain Arsenal, and I think the same yeah. thing. If, yeah, if you think there's, yeah, I think <laughs> even there's bad things in the soil, you know that that type of stuff. I, I would stay away, you know. But we also do, we don't pick asparagus right off the side of a railroad track either, because we feel mm -hmm. like things kind of drain off our railroad tracks. Um, we don't pick um, uh, puffballs or um, uh, caprinus right off the side of a gravel road either, feeling like the stuff runs off the side of a gravel road and it's kind of a gross area with potentially chemicals from the road going right into the soil. So, yeah. I mean, anything within a couple feet of the road is going to have a pretty extensive runoff too. Yeah, roadways you kind of want to stay away from. Um, golf, golf courses. Just use your best judgment. Nuclear yeah. power plants. <laughs> Chernobyl, you don't go there. Yeah, I mean, there's a discussion about, you know, comparing this to, you know, traditional farming and stuff that's used on that, but it's just, just use your best judgment, right? It's not, you know. Yeah. Um, should so, we hop on to the next topic? Yeah. Do you have any more questions about yellow morels, uh, Q and A? Mm -hmm. at? People offering morels for sale. Uh, there's um, Facebook probably groups. probably yeah, more so during too. during burn season. Yeah, I would say on that there's one. There's lots of people that sell morels. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a you kind of got to hustle your way into it though. It's not like maybe in in Oregon where there's a mushroom buyer down at the end of the road and he parks there every day and you can go take right. him 20 pounds of mushrooms and he gives you 20, 10 bucks in cash or something. You kind of hear you got to go to the back doors of restaurants and put it on Facebook <laughs> and kind of hustle the sales. Um, I think just, Facebook is, Facebook's probably the best place to. If you're looking to buy, yeah, I would. Uh, wrestle okay, that is, up. Yeah, they sent the message just to us, but <clears throat> ask about where, where to buy morels. And I would just say, um, post up on like one of the mushroom groups, like the Colorado Mycological Society. Exchange. Well, I misread the question. I thought I saw Kerry say he was a decent hunter and might be wanting to sell some. Uh, he was looking to purchase some. <laughs> yeah, purchase. You know, there's a lot of dried on, ones on, on groups, eBay. So. I would say if you want dried ones, they're all over eBay. Um, yeah. And the prices are better than Whole Foods where they're 25 I don't think I've more. ever purchased morels like I just, I don't know. Yeah. I have something wrong. Yeah, it feels wrong. But <laughs> nothing against people who do at all. Um, so What's next? Season, yeah, well, the season for, for, the, for the blonde morels is going gonna, gonna to run hard through April and April into May. Um, and then it starts warming up. We get summer conditions. Talk about like wh what the transition looks like for you into the, into the black morels. Yeah, so like I said, I follow the yellow morels up, you know, in elevation into the canyons into like late May, um, just looking for those soil temps. And then around Memorial Day, usually I switch to black morels. That's sort of like my first good black morel day on average, um, end of May. And what that means is that I am switching to mixed conifer areas or burns and um, I'll touch on the, the mixed conifer for natural morels first. Um, I kind of will just pick off or pick up right kind of at the elevation I left off for the blonde morels, right? So if the soil temps were good at 7,000 feet, I'll just go up into the mountains into the mixed conifers and start at 7,000 feet um, and check soil temps. And sometimes it takes a, you know another week or so, um, but um, that's that's the transition there and this. Yep, there's some there's some habitat. Um, nice. 
there's some habitat. Yeah. Mixed conifer. This is like mostly lodgepole ponderosa with some fir, dug fir mixed in, um, and, and then the occasional aspen. So when you jump to the blacks, um, and say you're at, you're you, you don't jump up in elevation at the same time. You you kind of just leave the riparian area and enter the forest. Is that? It it kind of depends on where I am. Um, Heather, no. So that's a good question from Heather. She, she asks, um, the blacks don't have to be in burns specifically. No, we have um, several species of black morels. We have, and there's two kind of subcategories of black morels. There are the natural morels and the burn morels. Natural morels are ones that don't fruit on burns, and they're different species. Um, and they're kind of what I really specialize in finding because we haven't had a ton of burns in northern Colorado recently. But I also do burn morels. Um, so yeah, there's there's multiple species of black morels, both burn and non-burn, to answer that. Um, and so yeah, I'll come out of the riparian area if I say stop at 7,000, and then I'll go up into my black morel areas and start around that elevation. It's usually a much higher just because I've got, you know, specific spots that I go to. But if I were just getting into it, I would go um, you know, from the same elevation, start checking soil. Okay. I, I was surprised from your pictures of areas, there's no aspen trees in here, um, of the many. kind of classic area. Does that, does that mean you, you tend to be more in the conifer forests or? I do. There are aspens in this area where this picture was taken. Um, they're just small patches of them. And you can see in this picture that this was an old burn, but this is like a, a very old burn, so. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're not getting burn morels. Nope, these are natural morels in this area. Do you find, do you spend time in the aspens though? Like if, if there were some aspens behind you, would you would spend look. as much time looking there as in the conifers? No, I wouldn't. I prefer looking in conifers. It just seems to be more successful for me. I know they do fruit in the aspens as well, but um, I have more success in the conifers and that might be because I'm used to, you know, I know to look in the conifers. What about lodgepole versus ponderosa? Are you in either or both? Um, if I had to choose, I would choose ponderosa just because I've had more success, but my go-to would be mixed conifer. Mixed. So, yeah. uh, you know, as many species, which is usually like lodgepole, ponderosa, dug fir, maybe some white fir if you're getting up into like the eight or 9,000, and then aspens as well. Um, uh, Heather, I find it, um, I find them both equal because I have a lot of experience doing it. I think a beginner would probably find it easier to look for yellow morels because their habitat is a lot smaller, right? It's just a little riparian area you're limited to. Black morels, you have the entire forest. Um, so I would say for a beginner, the yellow morels would be easier. Um, horse necks, I have, I'm not sure what that means. Um, uh, Terry's asking about uh, something called a horse neck. I'm assuming. I don't know what that is. Maybe like a half free morel. Um, but pecker, yeah, he pecker head, maybe? Yeah. Marcella punctipes. Um, we do have half free morels in Colorado, but they're pretty rare. So I don't know. You were, you were answering a question in here, maybe about your preference between the two. Um, yeah, the question was if it's easier to look for yellow or black morels. Okay, they, I didn't see that. I guess it was right to you. Okay. Oh, maybe it was. That's fine. Yeah. I think. Um, and your and what is your I'm preference a, then? You said either or, but for a beginner. Yeah. So I find it um, equally easy to look for both because I have a lot of experience doing it. But I think for a beginner, yellow morels would be easier because they are, you know, you're limited to the riparian areas in Colorado, um, so it's a much smaller search area versus millions of acres of forest, right? Yeah. I think it's fair to say too that natural morels generally are more difficult to find than say a burn morel. Yeah, I think um, of all the morels, burn morels are probably the easiest. If you have a burn near you, you're probably yeah. going to have the most success finding burn morels. But, um, you know, burn morels, then yellow morels, then natural black morels, probably. Mm -hmm. And what about a, uh, aspect? About yeah. Aspect. So, um, Southwest. So uh, Jessica 
as far as aspects go, um, I pretty much always start on north facing slopes or mushrooms in general. Reason being is that they hold moisture better. But um, if you start on a north facing slope and you stick your soil probe thermometer in and it says 46 degrees, uh, the south facing slope might be 52. They warm a lot faster. Um, you know, and you can play with that a little bit. You can hit like a northeast might be a little warmer because it gets more sun. A northwest is going to be the coldest and wettest. Um, so you can play with the aspects to kind of find the right temperature, you know, variations. You still want trees and, you know, the right habitat. But if they're, you know, if the aspects have those, then you can kind of play with it. So I usually focus on northern facing, um, but they, that's not to say that they won't grow on the others. And then same temperature, 50 to 60 degrees. Um, uh, the season's over at 60 degrees, Carrie, but it's not like the season is done at once the soil reaches 60 degrees. You just move up in elevation. That's the cool thing about our morels in Colorado. You can pick them into September if you know where they are. Yeah. Quantities are a lot, uh, a lot more reduced in, in the later summer, but they will fruit into September. Uh, what's next? Are you go are we going to talk a little bit about burn morels or? We sure can. Yeah. What do you guys think? Looks Anybody want to know about burn morels out there? There's a couple Q&A things that I pulled up. Here we go. Yeah, logging. Someone wants to know about logging records. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Everyone wants to know about burn morels, of course. Yeah, let's, t let's do the logging <laughs> records real quick. I don't know if you uh, go ahead and talk on that and maybe I'll add. Um, how long after rains? I don't really put too much uh, attention to rains for morels. It's a good thing to watch, you know, if an area is getting rain and you know it's getting rain, it's a good place to check after a few days. But um, like I said earlier, in my experience, if we had a good snow year, you can usually find morels. And, you know, maybe if it's dry, focus on those north facing aspects, focus on areas that might be getting a little more moisture because they're near a creek. Um, that sort of thing. And then logging records, I don't know much about that. Do you guys do anything with logging records? A little, a little bit. They're hard, they're hard to get um, without doing a lot of kind of research onto logging contracts in the national forests. Um, I will say the, uh, I use Gaia usually, but Onyx uh, for Colorado has um, logging um, areas designated by year. So that can be a start. That's true. I do look at those on Onyx. That's true. Mm -hmm. There's also, and you would laugh because there's always a, there's, there's a little fun competition between Gaia and Onyx and I'm, I'm, like, I'm on the Gaia side <laughs> yeah. of the fence and you know, there's a Ryan's new one now. Have you heard, on the have other. heard of the new one? What's the new Ga one? Gaionics? No, it's Gaia. called the uh, base map, I believe. <laughs> oh. It's called base yeah. map. Very similar to both of them. To check it out. The reason I'm on the Onyx side is because I started with it before Gaia existed. But Onyx has the best private property information too. If you're a hunter and you need to know who who owns the land, yeah. Onyx. Is Onyx there. Maps is what I use, and it's a it's it's made for hunting, but it's great for any sort of map needs. It's a they're, they're yeah. Like, now Gaia great. GPS is just a little bit better. So all those of you watching, if you want to. <laughs> Upgrade <laughs> Gaia GPS is for mushroom it's, hunters. Is the way it's also it. it's also cheaper. Yeah, yeah, and, and and national. But you know, it's okay that you like Onyx. We'll we'll let that slide. Onyx is national too. You just got to hey, pay uh, for every state. Yeah. Kristen's like, okay, back on topic. Well, before we move on to the burns, um, maybe Trent just touch for a second on morel hunting in Southern Oregon. Someone lives on the coast and wants to know. Oh yeah, oh yeah. About Southern that. Oregon is is awesome. Uh, uh, you got to get off the coast. You probably need to get right now. They're going to be in, in in Southern Oregon, but more in the you know uh, what's that town? Medford, Jacksonville, um, Gold. I want to say Gold Gold Hills. Um, that's where the early blondes come out, um, and then they they just move up west into the Cascade Ranges. Um, all the way to Idaho, um, and and they're going to be, you know, we, we usually look for the for them in the right, uh, riparian areas too, but they're they're much easier to find in Oregon than in Colorado. I mean, 
but uh, you probably, just can't do any of that right now in, in public land in Oregon, right? I don't think so. Right. No, yeah. no you, you can. They've closed trailheads and they've closed parking areas. But if you want to drive in the forest and I park on the side of the road, I don't think so. I think a lot of people are out saying that's okay. But Well, either way, check into yeah. it if you're in Oregon. Don't, yeah. Get, uh, don't get a ticket. Yeah, like the Lake of the Woods. That's what they're talking about. That's that area. Uh, um, up in the Cascades, and it's just a really popular morel area, and hmm. uh, uh, just has a ton of morels. But you, like, so you, like you say, you got to get there at the right time. Yeah, I went to uh, Oregon in 2018 and found a bunch of morels using your burn maps. So in cool. the burns, yeah. yeah. Well, let's yeah. let's go. Let's talk about some uh, a different burn morels now. To tell us what tell us what you know. Yeah. So I mean, burn morels are pretty straightforward. You know, you. you Find a burn and find morels there. Um, it's, All right, it's, end of the it's, webinar. It's, we're done, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Go find a burn and pick morels. Um, <laughs> the burn morel post, I think, the burn morel section of my series on my website, I think, is the longest one because there is a lot that can go into it with map scouting, burn scouting, picking the right burn, picking the right area of a burn. There's a lot more that that you know that can go into it than just picking a burn and going to pick morels, but um, it really can be that simple as here's a burn, let's go see if there's morels there. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing if you find it, if you get onto the, the morels in a burn, it can be better. You better have brought a bucket with you. Yeah, it can be so just overwhelming. A, a big bag, yeah. That um, little, that little basket that you put some pretty mushrooms in is, isn't gonna make it in the burn, but a few minutes, yeah. Um, you know, there's less about like where to find the morels in the burn and more about like picking the right burn, picking the right habitat or the right area within that burn. And um, I would say, you know, to get really a lot of information, just go read my post on that because there's a lot that goes into it. Um, Trenton and Kristen's maps are awesome. I use those myself. So I would definitely recommend checking those out if you know, you're interested in burn morels. Um, I use, like we were just talking about GPS systems. I use Onyx quite a bit. They use Gaia. Um, those are bo they're both uh, smartphone based, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can download maps and use them while your phone is in airplane mode and it'll still track your, your little pin waypoint. Yeah, so, that's the best. Yeah. Yeah, the best mushrooms, they, they do not like cell phone signals. No. <laughs> and it's, it's easy Very to tell because watch, when you find a bunch of mushrooms, your cell phone won't work. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, That's another one of my theories. Yeah, so this year, um, somebody asked this earlier and, and we didn't get to touch on it. This year, I guess last year, we had a very, a very light burn year, which is good, right? Yeah. Um, so we have fewer burns to, to choose from here in Colorado, but you can pick on second year burns. Um, that's, that's what somebody's just asking. You can definitely pick there. The quantities will be lesser, but they'll definitely still fruit. Um, how long? Um, it kind of depends on, on if the burn gets a lot of moisture. Um, I know yeah. people were picking morels on burns into late August last year. like September even. even. Yeah, into September and late August. So, I think it, it would have kept going, but it was too dry. Yeah. Yeah, we stopped getting If the rain, rain keeps coming, you know, because those in August, it's hot up at those elevations and they'll start drying out. But if the rain keeps coming, that you can pick them all summer long. So it kind of depends. Burn morels do need a little more moisture because there's no canopy to protect them from drying out, right? Yeah. Natural morels have a canopy over them to protect them. So. Yeah, we were up, I think, last year, August 13th, maybe. Yeah, your birthday. We were, my birthday, that's how I know, right? And, <laughs> yeah. And we were up at 10,200 feet, and there weren't many. By then, nobody's looking for morels. I mean, they're whatever they're doing, the last thing they're looking for is morels. We had a, this forest to ourselves, and it was, I mean, how, how many how many thousands of pounds did you want? It was like the entire yeah. forest was filled with morels. And we, yeah. you pick a bag and leave, but... Uh, it was it was just it was obscene how many there were. Burn morels uh, down here are way less popular than they are in like Oregon, Washington, mm -hmm. those areas. It's, which is 
fine. It's good, but um, you know, we the burn we went to when we were in Oregon, there were probably thirty cars there. Really? So, oh. Well, I think last year may have changed that a little bit for Colorado because it was such an epic. It epic was so year. good. Yeah, last yeah, year was, was probably the best year we've had in a couple decades. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we had we had some good times last year, and I think it'll be really interesting this year to check all the second year burns because, uh, like Trent mentioned, we really don't. I think there's maybe one burn in Colorado of interest that most people are going to be looking at that Decker fire. Yeah, the Decker fire um, down in Salida. Yeah, will be the most everybody's going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. It's steep. But yeah, as long as we get rain, areas, but... as long as we get rain and moisture, I think the year two burns can still be very productive. We'll see. I agree. Yeah, I, burns can can continue to fruit, you know, for three or four years, um, just in reduced numbers. So yeah, we're gonna probably, um, assuming the weather comes through like like we want, we're gonna wait for some good weather and head to probably Arizona. I see Elizabeth on here. Um, Arizona has half a dozen or more, just superb burned areas that are that are very pickable yeah. uh, new mexico and utah also have a lot of burns so i think i think for us we may you know we're right here near lake christine burn so we'll be hitting a second year burn but i think for our yeah. trips we, we want to go check out arizona yeah I've got, utah. One, I've got one little tiny burn near me and a couple of burns um otherwise i have to travel so i'll probably be on the natural rails mostly but i may do a little wandering we'll see <laughs> All right. Well, it's eight o'clock. We've been going for an hour and a half. Um, unless we have a couple other questions, we may want to. We may want to answer off here. Yeah, if people have general questions, I'm happy to answer some more. Just about anything. Um, I see Ella asked uh, if I come to Santa Fe, can I gather up Santa Fe for an outing? Uh, I'm sure we could probably arrange something. Um, <laughs> Ellen, Ellen Zakos is a, another foraging author. She's really great. She lives in Santa Fe. Um, so maybe I could work something up with her. I'll, uh, if I do that, Ella, maybe send me an email. And um, if I do that, I'll let you know. Okay. Well, and we're going to do next Tuesday. We're going to next Monday. Uh, we're going to talk with Graham Steinruck, um, who is a pretty well-known forager out of Colorado, who is now in uh, Olympia. And he's going to talk about the spring plants in the Olympia area. I know we're going to get into nettles fairly extensively. He's a chef, so I think we're going to come at a lot of this from a, an angle of, of preparing and cooking um, some of the same greens you were talking about. So I, I think it'll be That's pretty awesome. interesting. I'll probably uh, to try to tune in myself. There. Yeah, and he's super knowledgeable about, I mean, he just had to, had to cook up and, uh, and, and he, he knows more about mushrooms than all three of us combined, I think. <laughs> so uh, uh, he, he's going to be, a, 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 I think, a great interview that next uh, next week. Hey, Trent, yeah. tell people where to find the burn maps if they want. Modernforager.com. Yep, we have them on our website. We have a, a our ebook, which oh, I recommended. Wait, I got the ebook. You hold Here it we, up. Uh, oh, the real book. E. It's that that's the real one, yeah. We got the book there, the maps, bags, knives, but you know, we're not here to sell swag. Um, yeah. We're here to talk about mushrooms and food. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Orion. That was awesome. I hope we can maybe yeah. Yeah, catch up again you. during during definitely you know uh, the next the next season, which might be in six eight weeks. Anytime, anytime. If you guys be fun. Otherwise, doing, I'm happy to come back on. Say There's hi to him more. on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And if anyone has follow-up questions or wants to get in touch, Instagram, Facebook, email, any of those things, I'm really responsive. So feel free to reach out if you have questions or Great. Yeah, that. Thanks, everybody. Uh, awesome. Hopefully next Thank week our all. technology will be better too. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs> right. It's great to have right. you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye, Bye guys.